So those are our guests, and I'm going to ask them to, they're not going to put up any um, screen, screenshots or anything, they're just going to say a few words for five to six minutes, maybe a little bit longer in turn, uh, and then we'll have to sort of any questions, and then you'll have to. So I'm going to go uh, in alphabetical order, um, mm -hmm. which is the fairest. I'm going to start with Heather. <laughs> Sorry, Heather. <laughs> so, um, Heather, over to you. Awesome. Here we go. Good evening, everybody. Um, I have written this down. I have builders at the moment. I therefore have no brain, so I would not remember everything that I want to say. Um, but tonight, I'd like to talk to you about a beautiful concept. It's called creating ripples of impact. I first heard about this in a marketing talk in a Zoom room sometime in the last 18 months. And it struck me as an amazing expression and something that we all have the capacity to create. We only need to look at someone like Greta or Attenborough to know that their ripples have become tidal waves, tsunamis of influence and impact. And although we might not think that our individuals, individual actions will change things, actually, they will. But it seems that a lot of people only see the extremes of action. What if I'm not a Greta? Or I don't have a massive TV audience? Or I don't want to tie myself to a tree or storm a whaling ship or stand for parliament? in order to contribute to a better world. Well, those things might appeal, but if they don't, we can't sit idly by and do nothing. It was once said that the only way for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing, and we can all do something. I was listening to the news the other night, stupid thing I know, but there are days I wish I wouldn't do that, but someone was reporting it was so expensive and impractical to switch to eco-friendly, sustainable, ethical way of doing things. And people aren't just, just aren't prepared to bear that cost. But why does it have to be an argument in extremes? Either you have an eco and therefore expensive solution, or it's cheap and therefore it's um, destructive. The point of line too. Um, it got me to think again of what President Bush once muttered, I don't often quote him, I must say, in a very different context, and he polarised things by saying, either you're with us or you're against us, but life isn't like that. There's a vast gulf and range of things that can be done in between those extremes. Now we're surrounded this evening by amazing people, the, the, the events that we've had in these two buildings this evening, doing amazing things to enable us to make a difference in our own lives and to make a difference to the world, all sharing ways we can start to or continue to make those ripples of impact. But the truth is we've reached a point where those ripples really do need to become tidal waves. Sadly, the powers that be aren't hearing what is being said and translating it into real change. There's so much talk and so little action on the part of legislators, managers, superpower businesses, that it can feel like no matter what we do, we're not going to have the impact that we need to have. So we all need to get louder. We all need to do more. We all need to challenge what is happening, or rather, what's not happening. When I was thinking about what I was going to talk about this evening and writing my brief bio for Martin to read, I was minded of the simple message in that biography. I'm passionate about fairness and equality for all, for people and for the planet. And I realized that if we, as individuals and as a community, and focus on the five main principles of social justice, then by extension, we'll be looking after our environment, the plants and its people. Those five key principles include, include access to resources, equity, participation, diversity, and of course, human rights. And if every action we take, every decision that we challenge, every vote that we cast, every conversation that encourages, encourages us to challenge unfair speech, takes us one step closer to a fairer world, we will be making a difference. If access to resources is the key pillar of social justice, then that embodies a home safe from environmental damage, access to safe drinking water, food and air, safety for our families, and so much more. And if our actions, the actions of, and the actions perpetuated by government and industry are perpetuating social injustice, then we need to speak up. We need to do something each and every one of us. I know that I'm probably preaching to converted here, but without massive action by each and every one of us and encouraging those around us to do what they can, we won't have that impact. 
but it's hard to encourage everyday folk to do things when around us so, li so liberal seems to change. I'm alarmed on a daily basis to see how little of the rhetoric of green, this, that, and the other has talked of at the top being translated into visual, visible actions in our communities. How many solar panels have you seen on any of the houses and the countless new developments in our area or on the roofs of the industrial and state-owned buildings in our district? How many affordable houses, smart buildings that contribute to Hello, back. <clears throat> he said, how many affordable houses and smart buildings that contribute to rather than destroy the environment being created? And don't get me started on what's happening to the waste from our already overpopulated area. I used to love sea swimming. Now I have to check an app to see what's being dumped into it each morning before I put on my cosy and head out for a dip. Now, I'm not here to deliver a political manifesto, as action should be across the board and in collaboration. And I'm minded to mention the New Deal as instituted by FDR in the Great Depression. So FDR promised he would act swiftly to face the dark realities of the moment and assured Americans that he would wage war against the emergency. Surely we are in the darkest of times for our planet now, but we have to start doing things differently. Doing things the way we have done them throughout the last century has brought us to this tipping point for our world. And we just... Surely we are in the darkest times for our planet now, and we have to start doing things differently. Doing things the way we have done them throughout the last century has brought us to this tipping point for our world. We have to do things differently, challenge the injustice that the current national and global system is delivering. A few years ago, I went to a lecture given by the fabulous Kate Rayworth. Donut economics. Read it if you haven't. The simplicity of the solutions that could be adopted right now make me want to scream that they're not being implemented. Interestingly, a few weeks after that lecture, I was at a business event at a progressive university in a neighboring county, and in chatting to an economics student, she declared she had never heard of donut economics. They were still studying similar syllabus to the one I studied in the 80s. No wonder policy isn't changing. The circular economy the Green Revolution, the New Deal, call you what it will, it just is not happening. There should be outrage on the streets, or do we have to wait till we're swimming up North Street before action is taken? If outrage and placard waving aren't your thing, please write to your council, the paper, your MP, challenge the people that you vote for at all levels if you don't see the action that you want. And if you want to just take action every day and encourage your families and friends to do the same, and just don't know where to start. Chat to the amazing people around you tonight. Tune into the BBC series, 39 Ways to Make a Difference. We can create those ripples of impact, ripples of influence, and have a positive impact. There was a lovely concept called the slight edge. It's about doing something extra each day that you didn't do the day before, and the cumulative impact of those continuous tiny actions is extraordinary. And if we all do that, the impact will be profound and the impact will be long lasting. Take inspiration, make it perspiration. It's time to take some action. Thousands of tons of food that we've lost last year. 
Everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me as well. It means a lot. Um, I've written down what I want to say. Um, so as Mark introduced me, my name is Taryn. I am a sustainability officer for the University of Chichester Students' Union, and I'm also the vice president of our environmental society. My role is essentially to bridge the gap between the university staff and management and the student voice. And Something I'm really trying to aim through with my role this year is to let people know that it's okay to not be doing as much as you think you need to be doing. And you're probably already doing more than you actually realise. I feel like there's such a pressure on young people to be doing everything. And that's impossible. It's not achievable. And it's not fair to be putting that much pressure on yourself. Because if you put that pressure on yourself, how can you go much further than reach a burnout? Um, so doing one thing is better than doing nothing and every little step and mistake you make along the way is okay and it's valid and it's okay. So in 2019, our previous sustainability officer Molly Maddox, who is an incredible person, um, set up our environmental society. This was essentially with the intention of forming a group of students to back her up as she found that she was struggling getting as far as she wanted to with her role. So she thought, if I set up a group of students from all different courses, all different areas of the university, that's quite a strong representation of the student body. I can then take the collective voice of that to the meetings and say, you know, here's what the students are also thinking on top of what I'm thinking. 
and it worked and it worked really well. So one of the biggest achievements that um, the sustainability officer has done is um, encouraging the university to change its paper source to one that is far more ethical and sustainable, which I think is incredible. Um, so this year I took over the role and this also happened to be the year where the university staff from all areas of the university, all departments, um, set up handfuls of groups to work to make sustainable and ethical changes across our campuses. So one of the biggest groups I want to talk about is SEAM, which is Sustainable Environmental and Energy Management Advisory Group. Um, so um, we've split into different subgroups, so I'm just going to list them off now. Um, procurement, carbon offsetting, waste, education, campus biodiversity, buildings, divestment, energy, food and travel. So myself and the Environmental Society President, Poppy, who's in the audience, hello. Um, we go to a lot of these meetings to be a true representat uh, representation of the student body. And we've been involved in the travel, food and waste meetings, and more recently in the carbon obsessing and education groups. So in terms of travel, we're now looking at how students can travel to and from campus more sustainably. So we're looking at how we can increase the amount of public transport, adjust the timetables of lectures to fit better around, um, better around the public transport so that they will be less likely to want to drive, um, improving bike security and the safety and lighting along popular routes walking to and from the university. In terms of food, we're looking to increase the vegan and vegetarian options, introducing charges for disposable takeaway cups and containers and ensuring our food is always fair trade and ethically sourced. Um, we are also looking to, um, in terms of waste, banning all unnecessary plastics, increasing awareness on how to recycle correctly across our campuses. Um, and our takeaway containers are also compostable. And in terms of carbon offsetting, unfortunately a lot of the logistics on this are confidential. However, we are exploring all possible ways to decrease our carbon emissions. And the Environmental Society are uh, soon going to be doing things like tree audits to record how many of our trees are absorbing carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's just one of the many ways that we're supporting the university at the moment. Um, another thing that we're doing, which is really sweet, is Hedgehog Friendly Campus. So this is um, doing lovely things like um, making our campus a happy place for our spiky friends. So um, students and our Environmental Society are getting involved in feeding our hedgehogs, maintaining their houses, doing hedgehog tracking and seeing the society will also be running pond audits to make sure hedgehogs are safe around our pond. And with things like these happening, um, our environmental society has now been able to become a place um, for us all to work through climate anxiety, sharing information, sharing products, making friends, finding people to attend protests with. We also do litter picking beach cleans and we've become a great source of information for students to increase awareness and engagement across our campuses. But within all of this, I do face a lot of challenges, both on a personal and professional level. So I'd like to touch on climate justice and how it plays a part in my role. Climate justice is how people who suffer already from social injustice will suffer further and have their suffering amplified as a result of climate change. Something I found this year in my role is that the university is a very rich, privileged business, essentially but it is really listening to us as students and letting us know that our voices as students are valid, that my voice is valid and allowing us to join them in making some amazing changes. Something Molly, our previous sustainability officer and myself have found is that we have really influenced a wave of inward reflection across the university. Staff and students are beginning to challenge themselves, not just in their position at the university, but as individuals and are beginning to dig deep within themselves why this change needs to happen. In recent meetings, every single person that's in the room is agreeing that the environmental benefits and the moral duty we have in our very privileged position outweighs how much it's going to cost us financially. And I'm incredibly proud to say that I've been a part of that. But this is how we need to be thinking now. If you can afford to make a change, why aren't you? So again, this leads us back to social justice. There are many impoverished groups across the world that are suffering so much as a result of climate change, natural disasters, droughts, food shortages, struggles to get jobs to afford any food that's even on offer. But then we have privileged, rich communities and individuals that are not doing anything to help. We have celebrities going up to space because they feel like it. 
a personal challenge for me at the moment is trying to get to the bottom of why this is. Is it a case of out of sight, out of mind? Yet we are seeing the true, are we seeing the true effects of climate change yet? Not really, because we can turn the TV off, we can put our phones down, we can even arrange to sit down to have a conversation about these topics. For me personally, as a student and in my role, the fight for climate justice is about fighting for social, racial, sexual, gender equality, that we can all fight this fight equally and together. There is far too much privilege and not enough empathy. I find it difficult thinking about how many meetings and Zoom calls and emails and cups of coffee it's taken to get things done. I do understand in some respects, but it's just so frustrating. In an ideal world, a role like mine wouldn't exist. Festivals like this, conferences, debates on climate change wouldn't need to exist. And I hope in the future that climate consciousness and true climate justice will be commonplace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, what I'd like to do this evening is just, uh, I think, give a little bit of context uh, before I get to my key point. Um, because we in this room, we all get it, don't we? We all, we all understand the issue. But I sometimes think, well, actually, do we really get it? Have we really got the scale and the urgency of the problem? Do we really understand what we're facing before I get to my key point? I'm going to give you a few statistics here. You can't argue with, with, with physics, you can't argue with chemistry. So these statistics are kind of where we start. Think about how long we've known about climate change. We've known about it for, well, since about 1860, but let's come to recent, recent history now. Since 1992, 1992, the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit, we were going to cure climate change. That was, that was the point when the framework convention of climate change was signed. That was the point. Okay, it's in hand. We're going to cure climate change. Well, here's a statistic for you. Since then, more than half of the carbon dioxide ever emitted has been emitted. We've emitted more carbon dioxide since 1992 than in the entire history of the human race before 1992. That's the rate of change that you have with exponential growth. 75% of the carbon dioxide ever emitted has been emitted in my lifetime. Probably a lot more than that, although I don't take personal responsibility for all of it. There are a few other statistics we need to think about as well. Again, it's about physics. How much extra heat has actually gone into the sea as a result of that? But it's roughly the equivalent of a hydrogen bomb going off every minute for 150 years. And then let's think about tipping points. Let's think about how things might change. And think about this simple physics experiment. Take a block of ice at 0 degrees centigrade and you warm that up until it becomes water at 0 degrees centigrade. Okay, so the temperature hasn't risen. It's simply gone from being ice to being water. You then put the same amount of heat in again that water will heat up to 80 centigrade. That gives, that gives you a sense to realise just how important the ice caps are. If the, when the ice caps stop melting, all of that heat will go into raising our temperature. So these are the things we're, we're, we're having to face at the moment. We have an urgency of a problem that's not going away. We have a carbon budget. If we blow that, we'll go way past one and a half degrees centigrade since the Industrial Revolution. That carbon budget, at this rate of burning, we'll, we'll blow that in about five years, probably more. So the chance of actually staying in within 1.5 degrees is slim. Even if we bring all our emissions down to zero, we're going to have to carry on because there's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We have a concentration that hasn't been experienced by humans before. The safe level is probably 350 parts per million or less, probably a lot less. We're at 412, and that's going up all the time. Coming out of COVID, we're shooting straight back up to the same amount of emissions that we had before. Now, the reasons I'm saying this is not just to scare you, uh, you probably know a lot of these things, but I think we do have to grasp the size and the scale and the urgency of the problem. Baby steps won't do it anymore. We are now past the period of smooth transition. We often talk about transitioning, don't we, from one, one society to another. We had that opportunity. We've had that opportunity for 30 years. We're now past that time. My key point now is that we're moving to a period of disruption. Slow transition won't do it. What we're talking about now is disruption. I mean this in a technical sense, not in terms of societal breakdown or anything, but the concept of disruption. To get the speed of change, you can't look at little, little bits of movement, you have to look, look at disruptive technologies. Things make big leaps from one, one system to another. There's a famous picture, New York, in 1900, and it says underneath it, spot the car. Ten years later, there's the same picture, and it says underneath it, spot the horse. That was an example of disruption. The car completely disrupted in that respect. Now, we have got loads of examples of disruption like that. 
the CD disrupted the cassette and the, and the, and the, and the record market. The, uh, the DVD disrupted uh, the HS films and so on. So we know about disruption, how the new technology disrupts what went before it. We are at that stage now. We are looking at disruptive technologies. We're not looking at small changes. We're looking for things that are going to make the big leap. And they are, they are, they are actually in, in, our, in our consciousness now. Think about, think about solar, think about wind, think about batteries. They will disrupt fossil fuel industry. Fossil fuel industry, fossil fuel industry is only being maintained by, by, by corruption, effectively. It's being held up by, by subsidies and so on. That industry will be disrupted. It makes no economic sense to, to, to invest in, in fossil fuels for now. So this is my key point, really. It's actually about thank you. It's actually about looking for disruption. The problem is, quite often, you can only see disruption in retrospect when it's actually happened. We need to see where the disruption is coming and go with it. Very often, people fight against disruption. They see it as a problem to overcome. We often talk about the sacrifices we have to make. Oh, let's think again. Let's think about the back looking forward. Where's the disruption coming from? How can we work with it? Disruptive technologies, that's probably the easy thing. Of course, electric cars are going to replace fossil fuel cars, but that's a small thing. Of course, the wind and the are going to replace fossil fuels. Again, it's a fairly small thing. How about disruptive systems? How is our society going to change to be in the right place for a more sustainable, sustainable society? I don't know, but I'm thinking it's things to do with increased localism, increased smart technology, looking at it locally rather than, rather than nationally, that sort of thing. Now, once, once I finish now, we're just three words. What do we have to think about in terms of the scale that we need to, the way we need to work? Just three words, community, place, and purpose. We can get very depressed about it with echoing anxiety, but think of, well, community, working with the community. First thing to do, often you get a list of jobs to do when you're not a conservationist, don't you? First thing to do is find people of like minds, join a group, find a community, work with them, work with people who are working with you. Second thing, your place. Cherish your local area, cherish your local place, your local nature, I would say that, wouldn't I, coming from the Sussex Wildlife Trust, but your local nature is important, it's actually what keeps you alive, earth systems. And the third thing is about purpose, having a higher purpose in what you do. Become a citizen, not a consumer. Have empathy, be sharing, and so work with people, don't just think of yourself as a consumer. Now all of these things are actually, I haven't mentioned buying more, more fast cars or earning more or, or working harder, have I? These are the sorts of things which will overcome echo anxiety. So that's where we're on to leave it at the moment. It's the idea that we need to think disruptively, find that, that disruption, go with it, look for the new society, and work together as a community. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and thank you to the other panelists as well. I've now got these facilitated questions for you. Um, I actually think that the panelists have already answered some of these questions. So I will ask them, um, but I'll ask for a one-liner response from you, because what I'm keen on is to hear what your questions are in the audience as well. So if you forgive me, I'll rush through these, and I'm going to start coming this way again. Um, Heather, sorry about that. Um, so it says here, most people here today will be familiar with an accept science, so we are facing the climate and ecological question unless urgent action is taken. I say everybody here um, uh, understands that. But it can be difficult to know what to do in the face of these facts. What advice would you give to others who want to get involved but don't know what to do? Uh, Heather, you've given us some tips already, but let's have some one line from you and then Yvonne, Karen, and Tony. Yeah, I think very much, you know, it will start by saying, you know, it's recommending people to start listening to, you know, 39 things to do is to make things that are accessible. Um, and it's also it's just to understand the other person's perspective when you are talking to someone who doesn't quite get it in the way that you do. Um, understand the perspective and come towards it. You know, where I've all over and with people are trying to do is actually they've got to, they've got to be on a journey to try to be on a journey to get to where we are. So it's about getting people, that's how you get by, that's how you get to be disruptive and you get people to come along. Yvonne, Tom, do you need me to speak in the mic? Because nothing else is like that. I would say do, because actually we're all very good at talking. No talk, also investment. I would say do. Um, 
So for someone like me, I will get to crack or do it. I'm a big, let's just do it. So I would say, work with people and think the same as you. Buy locally, buy sustainably, think about things, think about the ethics of things. Uh, buy second hand, and I think second hand is good fun. Um, but also, I would say, do it. Just do it on the small level first. Um, well, I would say firstly, you know, I mostly liaise with students and young people and, and the question of what can I do is generally a huge question. Um, so the first thing I always ask people is what do you feel you're doing at the moment? Do you use things like a reusable cup, reusable period products? Are you very conscious of how much electricity you're using? Those are really good first steps and it does actually mean you're already doing something. And I think a lot of young people feel like they're not doing anything when actually they are. Um, I think don't put too much pressure on yourself. Um, I think for certain people, maybe put your pride to one side just for a minute and think about actually asking the questions that you really do want to ask. It's not, you know, it's, it's such a positive thing to actually be brave and say, how can I help? How can I be doing new things instead of just assuming that you're maybe doing enough? Um, yeah, look locally, a lot of self-reflection, um, join local groups, get involved in things like this. Um, a lot of them are very free, they're very accessible, anybody can go to them and just do the budget. Um, so yeah, the, the answers are out there and, and the opportunities are out there, you just need to be willing to look for them. Thank you, that's probably where I ended up, ended up what I just said. Community, join a local group, join with people that are, that are of like minds, cherish your local area and seek higher purpose. I mean, that's what we need to do. The other thing I would actually say though is, uh, is push upwards by lobbying. A lot of what we can do individually is actually really quite minor in the greater scheme of things. So what we do locally actually forms the political pressure to push upwards. So that's the key thing. So what we do locally, we need to actually lobby upwards as well. Because if, you know, what we do can be actually pushed off as basically a con. You know, we can all get bogged down in, in, in our own individual little actions. If we're not actually pushing upwards as well, then we're just being diverted from the bigger picture. Some really good answers there. Thank, thank you. There's, there's only three more to go, but um, a very quick one again. Uh, and there's something I hear a lot from our generation, I have to say, which is what's the point of any individual action or local level initiatives? Uh, they can't make a difference in the face of a global problem of this magnitude. I think we've had some of the answers already, but we'll go around. Yeah, I think we have. We've sort of covered that a lot. But I, I personally, I think it's it's. It's, it's at every level. We can all do something as individuals, but as, as you said, you've got to push up. And But also it's about challenging, as I said in my talk, about challenging the people you vote for. If they start doing stuff, or you're not seeing, if they say, I'm going to do A, B, and C, and they end up doing X, Y, and Z, you've got to challenge them. You've got to keep, keep, keep on to people. It's a way that we can all do something. Everyone can sit down and come, you know, make connections with the people in power. There are, there are ways to do that. So we've got to keep pushing. I think I would need to minimize the impact that one person's actions can have. Absolutely. Because if we all stopped shutting food out, we would cut food waste by 70% in the UK. And can you think we need thousands of tons of food that we put every touch of every single week? That's massive. So I would say do, do your bit and, and don't put your videos on the time. Really? I don't know what to talk about. Um, so I had this conversation with Poppy, I'm not going to take the credit for what she said, but when you are purchasing things, that's essentially you putting a vote towards something and you're letting the business know that this is my journey started with veganism and when I first became vegan I found that there was nothing on the shelves and in the few years that, that my journey has progressed everything is there everything is accessible and everything is becoming really affordable and that's because of individual people choosing to purchase these products and I think with everything everything has to start small and you know you take, take things like today this one this one started very small and then grew and the more people that get involved with it there's that saying of like little waves make a big ocean cheesy like that but it's true and um, take things like COP26 is happening at the moment that also started on a local level take things like Extinction Rebellion that also started very small and it you know it, it grows 
and um, it, it, everything has to start small and everything's very valid and um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop rambling. <laughs> Difficult to find a different answer, but I'm going to give you one. That is, we often present, we often present change as something we want to avoid, something you know, we're starting to sacrifice for the new world, and to say the planet is presented as kind of sacrifice. We should say it the other way around. The world is changing, and actually, we need to get into position for the changed world. And actually, if you do that, if you look, look into the future and try to work out where we're going, get there first, you'll have early adopters' advantage. So, this is not about doing, doing things to sacrifice and make your life worse to save the planet. This is actually about being in a good position in the future and planning back from it. So actually I'd say a different sort of attitude where you're thinking about the future and how much better it will be to actually have a better future, a more sustainable future, and therefore what does your life look like in it? And actually that's more, more of the sort of change we need to encourage rather than the kind of hair shirts on arguments we sometimes see forced upon us, because I don't think we do that. Thanks, Tony. Now I'm going to move to the last question then, and, and then we'll go to the um, so, Pamela, if you had one message to political leaders participating in COP26, what would it be? The one I'm this. Stop caring more about your friends and start caring about the people and the planet. Thing I would say is educate, educate people, tell them what they can do, and tell them in a way that they want to be communicated. Big lesson to all. Um, just it's not about you, just for five minutes, this isn't about you. This is your chance to actually be listening to us. I know you never want to listen to us, but you're here, so why aren't you deciding to listen to us now? Um, if we strip back your title, your money, your privilege, and strip everyone's back, we're all equal and we all need to be fighting this fight equally together. And you're making it really bloody hard to do that. I was just thinking of one thing that might indicate that these words might actually have some ground. And uh, they all said stop, so I'm going to say stop as well. Stop all future fossil, fossil fuel exploration. Yeah. Thank you. Right, we're now going to move to questions from the audience then. And Tom is going to take around the microphone and he is going to uh, wipe the microphone after each uh, question. And um, I I, I will put my glasses at long distance glasses in a second, but I can already see Councillor Abel with that hand up, and Jonathan Brown, and then Mark. So we're, if we take those three first, and then I won't overlook anybody. Thank you, Martin. Claire Abel. Um, obviously, this isn't a local question. However, this year we have discovered that wind. Wind has not been as efficient as it could be because we happen to have the winds that we normally get in this country. Why is there no talk about tidal? We, we live in an island, we have tides four times a day in certain areas, and yet no mention is made of tidal, of bringing something tidal to make our, us energy efficient. Why? Can somebody answer that question? I'll have a quick go. Um, I, I hope the other day it's twice as expensive as wind, but in my mind, that's still not an excuse. I mean, I, I think that question is best left hanging because there are probably lots of techn technologies that we really ought to be deploying. And so, simply because they're a bit more expensive at the moment, this is at the moment that we haven't even started with this technology and get the, 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 the savings you make when you actually deploy something quickly put it ahead of the game. So I think it's best to let that leave that question hanging because of the sort of technology we ought to be using. And you're dead right, it's completely predictable. So why don't we use it more? Good question. And now, Jonathan, you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, 
just as an example of the sort of change we need is obviously a lot of people to switch from using a car to uh, bikes. And there are places in the world, Netherlands being a good example, where a lot of people have done that. And I don't hear about Dutch people saying, oh God, I wish we could go back to using everyone using a car again. Can you, do you know of any examples of how you can help encourage people who currently think it's such a massive shift? Yes, in theory, we need to do it. We understand why we need to do it, but I'm used to driving a car. Everyone drives, there's no cycling infrastructure. How do you get people to think in such a way that, yes, we're going to make this change? That, that really is a good question. And we've, we've probably got an answer from the floor as well. But I'm going to ask some of the panelists first. And then I'll come to the gentleman with the cycling jacket on. I think you hit the nail on the head yourself there when you talked about infrastructure. So if you look at our big cities, there's such a huge drive um, on getting people cycling or walking to work. There's um, benefits you can give people that work with you if they cycle to work or they walk to work. Um, I, I know that the organisation I work with, um, we do that. But actually it's infrastructure is going to be the biggest thing. It's a cultural shift. It's a massive cultural shift that's needed. Because you do still see, I know when we had the COVID blades in Kingston, and you saw people cycling, you saw motorbike motorists because they don't want to share the road. So it's a big infrastructure. So I think that should be one of the local council, actually. So I'm not just putting the on there. And uh, <laughs> I think that's one of the things that I've put West Sussex County Council as well. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and just on that, yes, I am on the council, and, and yes, I, I watched it happen. Um, but I think there's, there's also, there needs to be a lot, when, when those things do happen, there has to be um, consultation with people who know about it, is talking to the, you know, the, the, the cycling people who know what to do, and yet somehow it sort of seems to be done in isolation from those. So absolutely, infrastructure is absolutely key, and, get, and it is a total cultural shift that this is a good thing, and it needs to tie in with the public transport side of things as well. That everything is all about the car, and and even when people are talking about all the things we need to do about transport, everybody only seems to talk about electric cars. And it's like this is electric cars. I'm sorry, are not the answer. It's part of the answer, but it's not the entire answer. So huge infrastructure, but incentives and encouraging, and also demonstrating for people to actually see other people doing it. Um, and that it works and all the benefits, because of course you get all the health benefits from it as well. It's not just, it's not just the planet, it's for us as individuals as well. Um, well, again, speaking from the university, bikes are actually really popular, so that's something that's positive. Um, I guess because they're affordable, they're more affordable for students and um, our public transport that we have going in and out of the university is always that reliable and students can't always afford their cars and they're also actually discouraged from driving into the university. Um, so from my perspective, they're actually very popular and there's a lot of that happening and we're also working very, very hard to increase bike security um, and make sure that cycling is definitely an option for all students. So something positive to answer the conversation. Well, that's a one word answer, electric bikes. Electric cars aren't revolutionary, they're just another way to drive a car. I think electric bikes are revolutionary. Try an electric bike and you're a little bit worried about cycling. It takes about two revolutions of the pedal and you're converted. So, actually, I think electric bikes will help. That's, uh, I'm going to come just before I go. That gentleman in the um, uh, high bids, I think, wanted to make a point to the person's question. Hello. Yeah. Um, I've just had my 10th birthday and September 24th, 8 plus 2, that is. I've been a vegan for 40, 45 years. I eat very little. Um, we, when I sadly lost my partner a couple of years ago, Karen, she was a 100% raw food vegan. And um, we used to go foraging and pick wild food. And um, I rarely cook. Ever. I eat most of my food raw and um, ate a lot of fruit. Uh, and believe me, a lot of the problems caused in this world is food meat eating, cancer, diabetes, heart disease. Big, big problem, massive problem. They've got a massive problem for the NHS coming up. I don't doubt whether they will cope with it if we don't change. It's getting like America with. Uh, 
we are on a grand scale, quite honestly. It's a bit disturbing. Um, you don't need to eat a lot. People eat too much, as they say in America. Um, you need sedentary lives. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a people who don't ever watch television. And uh, and um, I, I bike everywhere and uh, coming up to 600,000 miles of done in all England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, a bit in France, Belgium, Germany, and Austria. And uh, I can still beat pe pe people half my age up hills. Yeah, well, I'm going to stop you there because uh, there's lots of really good questions, although we did mention cycling, but there's a good message there as well on, on, on diet, no doubt about that. Um, I just, I just want to ask you a question. Rick. How many guys do you have got an electric bike? Guys? I mean, everybody. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There I go. I know that one long time. But you know, I've got an electric bike, Tony. But I don't use it that much. And do you know why? Because there isn't. I live up at Lucian Park, top, top end of Oakham Park. And there isn't a safe route. To come into the city centre on my electric bike. They're able to try to run. Exactly. Right. And it's scary. Right. I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going to be at the city case there. It's not a preaching thing, but there, yeah, but not top of them. Yeah, I'm trying to get into this. So you're, you're right. I mean, electric bikes are great, particularly for those of us who are getting on with it. But you've got to have safe routes. As well. Now, Mark Redford, you were next to I was going to be very much on the same line as you, Mark Redford. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Very, very much on, on the same line as, as, as it's been discussing. Um, I want to know how we're going to challenge um, government. On We know what we should be doing, we know we should be moving away from car dependency. I know everyone having private motor vehicles and driving everywhere is possibly the worst option. Even if we change to electric, it's still festooned with problems. It's enormously inefficient on use of land. Um, you still have to deal with huge roads, they're enormously destructive to the environment. And we know that we can encourage cycling. We should be reallocating space so people can cycle in town. And we should be increasing rail and tram and buses. These are not complex things, and it's done throughout Europe. But what we've got is we've got government is actually doing the opposite. Highways England risk or risk two, I think the policy, their answer to it is going to expand the road network and have more and more cars. This is just completely but I mean I I, I don't I'd like to ask how we're going to challenge this. And we've also got highways England now putting what they're calling a uh, a non motorist user scheme down the A259, um, and their plan is to take cyclists out of the roads to have more traffic for new development and shove them on the pavement so that people can't use their own high streets in places like Southport. Um, we should be reallocating space from motor cars and putting that toward walking and cycling. But Highways England are actually doing the very opposite to facilitate more dense use of local roads, they want to put the cyclists onto, onto urban pavements. So how are we going to challenge um, government when we, they say the right things, the policies say the right things, but in practice they're doing 180 degrees, they're going the wrong way. How are we going to challenge them on their feet to the fire? Uh, that's a really good question. I'm going to ask the um, <laughs> um, my way to the mark are making changes, right? They've changed their name. It's now, it's now National Highway. So they're making changes. I'm going to hand over there. Uh, yeah, I'm also a cyclist. I used to cycle to work in London. That was a scary thing. Um, I did survive. But um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I sort of watched things go through, sort of, you know, as a councillor. Um, and as I said earlier, it just stresses me because they say these big policies and then nothing happens. And this is, yeah, for me, 
we have to just keep, you know, every single time we sit in council um, and these things don't happen, you just, you, you just, and, and I, I despair in a way because I kind of, you know, and then the, what's called the budget comes out last week and they're, you know, they're subsidizing air, local air travel, you know, trains are more expensive. Oh, let's make the planes cheaper, you know, and, and constantly this is happening. So, um, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, and I wish I did. I petitioned my local councillors and MP. Uh, I would absolutely petition. I would get as many people as I possibly need to sign these petitions. Get everyone to get on <laughs> the email or write, and I need to drown them in correspondence because there's power, there's weights. If anyone that's campaigned for anything before we know, there's the more people who have, the more weight you have. But I would petition them, and I'd go local councillors, this isn't appropriate, not happy, not happening. This is our future. It's not you're there as representatives of the public. You're not happy. That's what I do. Disruptor. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you think and uh, I think that's a classic example of a traditional approach fighting against disruption that's coming. You know, there, there is disruption happening to the way our transport system works, and uh, what is being held back by subsidy and persuasion from a traditional approach. I don't, not sure why I'm reminded, but Henry Ford said if he'd listened to what was happening at the time, he'd have invented the faster horse. Yeah. <laughs> it seems we're in that sort of situation. We're trying to make do with an old fashioned 20th century transport system rather than moving forward into a new system. And I'll say it's actually it's the whole system. It's not we must change to electric cars or even we must change to bikes or, or trains or trams. It's actually, this is my point about systems disruption. I think we're looking at a society in the future which is going to be much more localised. Get, get what we need in terms of materials, in terms of manpower, in terms of people, locally, but actually things like standards and quality, they'll be international. Information will be international. So I think we're moving to a new society where this will change. But that's the disruption that's coming. It's not the argument about Another lane that's going to cure the traffic, is it really? We tried the Hackford, did it work? No. I spent practically all my time in Sussex Wildlife Trust arguing against barking mad trying to road schemes. And often they still went ahead. I put together some of the most eloquently argued cases I can think of. I'm not sure I made any difference. I'm not sure whether that, that, I think it might have helped. I've written to the MPs, I think it probably did help, but I don't think it's made a difference. I think it was other people who made a difference who were actually prepared to get out and demonstrate. Which I feel is sad to say, but I think actually it's, it's, it's some of the people who are prepared to put themselves on the line who make the biggest difference. Extinction and voting, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, can we just stick with the cycling? The, the gentleman with the beard, the blue, he's got a yeah, blue. That's the, that's the gentleman, yeah? And then the two guys at the back, I'll come to you as well. I'll, I'll let the guy with the blue, yeah, the beard on, go first. Then I'm going to come to the lady with the red mask. And then I'm going to go to the two young guys at the back. Okay. So, uh, have you got the mic? Oh, how close do you have to put it? This close? Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm George from Sticks and Rally, just to, I'm one of the few airline pilots calling for our industry to decarbonize the trip. And um, I find myself a big conflict. Um, I think my, my friend Paimo will ask one of the questions I wanted to ask. So I'll ask the different question. It's less of a direct question, more of a conversation starter for the panel. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more, more about representation, uh, representation of age, gender identity, race, uh, sexuality. And, for me, it seems like we have poor representation, both in green movements in general and in government and councils. Um, and it links directly in with what Taryn was saying about climate justice. Um, are we all in our groups here making the link between climate justice and our eco actions uh, and racial justice, and gender justice, and social justice, and indigenous justice? Are we uplifting in this room black and brown voices enough? Uh, are we uplifting indigenous voices? Are we reaching out to communities within our community that aren't 
generally involved with this. Um, normally, are we stepping out of our comfort zones enough to bring about the justice we actually need to see and realize that green eco justice, environmental justice is not just our individual actions, but also a systemic thing that links in with most other injustices in the world? Are we tackling the symptoms or are we tackling the cause of it, which is an oppressive, discriminatory, racist, sexist, transphobic? Um, colon, colonizing the system that we live in. Are we treating the symptoms or are we treating the cause itself? Okay, I think. I have a the questions and I'm sure the panel has as well. So I'm going to go back to the panel again, start with Emma, yeah? Hello, hello, Professor. Um, yeah, thanks, George. That's a whole evening of, of, of discussion that you've opened up right there. Um, it very much is, I think, so many of us have probably shown by my previous um, answer, is that we are in this, this system which is so bound up in, in tradition and the, the, the system and the old boys network and the everything else. That it, I, I think so many people feel completely hamstrung by that. And what can we do next? How can we, you know, be more be more inclusive? Um, we had a debate very early on in, in council about the hours that we had our meetings, and uh, one of the councillors who said, "Well, you know, if, if you wanted to, yeah, the, the people who are here, you knew what time the meetings were going to be." It's like actually, if we knew meetings were going to be at other times, then you could attract. You know, a younger, more diverse, single parent, working parent, whatever type of people to come onto the council because actually our council needs to represent um, our society and it doesn't. I'm, I'm the youngest and queerest councillor there is, and you know, I'm in my 50s. So, um, yeah, I, in that respect, I do not represent the people of Chichester or the people of our district. So, you know, we have to be able to engage people, engage our community, and that's about, you know, it's about getting out there and having conversations with people and that they feel included and feel, can feel part of that conversation, because I think there's just too much alienation in terms of the society that we, that we have here, because we, we are perceived as being the sort of middle class white sort of society, sort of homogeneous society. And we're not. There's actually a huge number of people that we really do need to be engaging with, and I wish we could do more of that. Uh, the work that um, the organisation I work with does in Chichester um, and along the coast is very different to the work that we do in London. So, for example, um, we work, although we work in schools and we work right across the spectrum, and we try to work with as many people who want to be engaged as possible. Um, Chichester is pretty much middle class and white, um, and that's a massive effect. Um, but in London, we, we may work with big communities, we probably work with 85% of the minority ethnic. We work with organisations like Free for Life with a big focus on knife crime. We do barista training, we look at you know, gang culture. So it's a very, very different way of working, and there are different communities to work with. And that's not saying that any is more vulnerable than the other, because I think there's people need right across the spectrum. But we can only work with the cards we've dealt with, and we can only change from within. Um, I, I don't really know what I should deal with. I mean, I was up talking to uh, some of the people who came to this week, and um, just to, about the ethics of foods. And why we should buy locally, and, and why we should think about what it is that we buy. And where it's come from, and what does that actually mean? So, I mean, your question is an absolute day's worth of a debate, and um, because I think it's a really important point. But actually, I think for it, for our organisation, I think we like to think that we are pretty equal in our approach to things, and, and I think we're pretty more discriminatory. We try our absolute best, but actually, you can't think that way to all those things. But we get to make the things. Uh, 
Um, mine's going to be a bit of a short answer, really, because I'll happily admit that this is something I'm still learning. This is something I'm still looking into. Um, but the biggest thing that I'm learning at the moment and that I'm encouraging people to look at is which fight is actually your fight and which fight needs to be passed on to the people uh, whose fight it actually is. So what I mean by that is um, I am a, a white British woman and my fight is not the same as someone that is from a racial minority. Um, and it's not my place to be speaking on behalf of them. It's my responsibility to be passing the microphone over to them. And that is something that um, we all need to be doing. So in short, basically recognize which fight is actually your fight and uplift the voices um, of the people that need to be fighting. Yeah, it's very, very easy to fall into the trap of kind of being defensive at this point, isn't it? And say, well, I haven't always been this old and white, you know. Um, and I think, think of the Sussex Wildlife Trust, and I think, well, actually, most of the, all, you know, the senior management team is mostly female, and they have, all of them are a hell of a lot younger than me. But this isn't the point, really, is it? Um, I think you're dead right, and we always have to keep this challenge. Well, I don't think we'll ever get there. We always have to keep challenging ourselves about, you know, not, not just the people in the room, but the people who aren't in the room, the people who aren't in the room, to get to. And it's always been a fair criticism. We haven't really got to the range of people we ought to be getting to. One thing I'll say above all this, though, is that uh, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, and let's, let's not forget that, they are inherently racist at a high level. You know, what we do wrong here is creating racist issues across the world for people who didn't deserve it. So if we, even if we fail dismally about our racial issues here, uh, you know, that's the underpinning problem. Now, we're causing massive problems elsewhere as well. So in, in my mind, that overrides, overrides a lot of the things that we're doing here. We've got to get this climate crisis and biodiversity crisis cracked. It's simply through, through a, a, an equity situation with, with what we vaguely call the global south. As we do, I'm just going to move now to the lady with the red mask, please. And then I'll come to you guys at the back. Um, going back briefly to cycling, and um, in both of these points, I want to bring things down to the local level to Chichester. Um, as I understand it, there is something called, um, I nickname it Elsie's Whip, because I remember it that way. Elsie Whip. <laughs> the Elsie Whip, which as I understand it, stands for the Local Cycling and Walking Infrastructure Plan. Yes, and as I understand it, it has been adopted by our local council, and that would provide a better infrastructure for people who are afraid to cycle because it's too dangerous. But there seems to be, um, and again, it's, it's what Greta Thunberg has been saying as well, the plans are out there, they're all blah, 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 but there's no action. And I guess it's because there's no money, but there is money around somewhere to put these things into practice. So my first question recycling, uh, especially, and not only to those on the stage, but those councillors around in the audience, is when can the LC whip be put into place so we will see, and again, it's what Mark was saying about a change in space, so that we have more space the safe space for cyclists and pedestrians around Chichester. That was the first thing. So I need the housing. On, on that one, I'm yep. going to ask you about this. I'm going to ask the, we've got a county council here, we've got a couple of councillors. Maybe they would respond to that one. Mm -hmm. Heather and you. Uh, well, it's not just me and Heather, we've got some yeah. others in the audience as well. Yeah. Uh, 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 um, well, would you like to comment? Sarah, would you like to say yeah. anything to that? I mean, because the reason I'm asking Sarah, and I'm not trying to put her on the spot, it, it, it is Valerie, isn't it? Yes. I mean, one of the things in terms of making things happen here, and George, I'm sorry, but we're working within the but is the fact that we have these peers of government. So, you know, who's responsible for the pavements in the city centre? Yeah, West Sussex County Council. It's not the district council, it's not the city council. And who's responsible for LC WIP implementation? County Council. 
So, I'm, and I'm not knocking the fact County Council, what I'm knocking is the fact that we do have these three levels. And I spend a lot of time in Brighton, where we have uh, a unitary council. So it's just one council, Brighton Hope Council. I think they're green at the moment, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, they have been Labour, sometimes they're Conservative. Um, and they do seem to get a lot more done over there than here. So that was just my comment as a petition district councillor. I'll hand over to uh, you guys, want to say anything? Or Sarah, would you, would you like to comment? Then we'll come back to the we'll come back to your next. Well, um, probably some of the other councillors will know that one of the schemes from the council has been chosen for a feasibility study. So that's all. So, you know, it takes so long, and, you know, there are multiple sections of your LC RIP. So, one, I think in the whole of the council, three were put forward for feasibility. Doesn't mean to say they're going to get built, and I think it's partly because of all the anti-motorists or the, the, the motorists being anti-motorists. The county is now really, really cautious that whatever they do is going to be acceptable to the, 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 the motorists. So it, it is a question of funding, and my my big question, I suppose, the the, the millions and millions that go to the big road. Whereas, you know, the poor people like Mr. themselves, and they still haven't the money to do the minister. They still, I have never cycled to Sunset. There still isn't a cycle park. You know, and they, they work really well together. They do the ability to have disaster happens. It is just so frustrating and so slow, but it is the priorities of our. Most of the electorate, I would say, and most of um, the, the council, council has always been, you know, we need to build all these roads and all this. What I'm saying, what I'm saying, what I'm saying. That's, that's my view on it. Um, so, yeah, one of your schemes, Barry, is going forward to people and they've chose that for, they thought that would be less. And maybe, maybe we'll get rid of those problems. Do we know when, Sarah? I'm just going to ask everybody to make one comment on that, and then I'm going to go back to Valerie for her second part. I think this is one of the frustrations with this, this whole thing of sort of they say one thing and, and do another. So they say there's this green thread running through everything in time. And then, but yeah, in my in my mind, that should be that every single planning application that goes through right now, if you want to put up some houses, you have to provide cycle lane, walking infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, verbal access, to medical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you do not do that, you do not get planning permission. It's as simple as that. And if they don't start putting their foot down to enable that, we're never going to get anywhere. Every time a planning application comes up, a city level certainly following the system. Um, okay, uh, second part then, uh, and then we come to you guys. Um, okay, again, this is uh, local and it's Chichester. I was at a talk uh, last week uh, when the ex chair, I think she was, of South Downs National Park gave an address. Um, telling us about what the National Park had been doing and the history of it. It was fascinating. But one thing she said was regarding planning, because houses are built within the National Park and they therefore um, approve or don't approve the planning. And they have now put down the criteria that all houses built must be zero carbon, which I think it's excellent. And she said, what's more, East Hampshire have taken this policy on board for their plan. So I'd like to know, when will Chichester take this on board? Well, I think that's probably a question for the councillors to answer here. And um, I mean, I don't know the answer to that right now. It's a lot easier with the National Park because you don't have the big scheme coming through. What I would say, as a member of the um, former member of the planning commission is that anything that our local councillors are very important, I always know about this in some sense, 
anything we say in terms of things like that, unless it meets with the national guidelines, you're going to be in a problem. And um, frankly, whenever you do get this, it goes to appeal to developers, not with the sort of people who don't get the time, that's the part of the game, but with the big firms, it goes to appeal, and you get someone from Whitehall, an inspector that has no local loyalty who will just strictly force current national government policy. It's very frustrating, but I, so I can't, we, we are doing our best at city level to make sure that um, we, are, we, we, we can say that, but at the end of the day, what we say, I mean, whether we can influence or not, another matter, Jonathan's going to come in now, Jonathan Brown, who is a district councillor, and it's their April, but I will get to you two guys as well. I promise. Just Jonathan and Claire, and then we'll move to the guys. Thanks. Just, uh, <clears throat> this point about national policy is true, but it's a big problem. And we've just got to hope the government, when they eventually publish their new housing standards, it will be an improvement. I don't think it's going to be sufficient. But the thing I wanted to say, in Southbourne, which is the ward I represent, um, <clears throat> is creating a neighbourhood plan. And one of the policies within Southbourne's neighbourhood plan says is, is, is hoping to introduce a planning condition on all new development that says once the house has been built it will be tested to see if it meets the current energy efficiency standards and virtually no house built today meets the current energy efficiency standards so our policy is is hoping to introduce this condition which says if it doesn't meet the current standards you'll have to pay to retrofit it to meet the current standards Instead of doing this, you could build a passive house standard from the beginning. Our, our plan is currently at examination, so I don't know whether the examiner will say we're trying to sort of bend or break the law more than we're allowed to, but we'll see. So, yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. 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 Which I was trying to stop years and years to get in. Um, one of the issues is that when it came to climate emergency, I said you're only putting solar panels on about 15 to 20 percent of the houses. That apparently was what the guidelines were from the central government made in 2015. Can you imagine that you're building the states 15, 1600 houses? And they only have to be solar panels for about 20 to 25 percent. New builds coming from now, they'll insist on many more. But those 1600 houses will only have 25 percent solar panels. And it's, it's as a, as a councillor, it is so frustrating. You feel as though you're hitting your head against a bit more. And the officers always go for the easiest way because they don't want to break the law. Thank you, Claire. Now, the gentleman uh, behind George is in the grey top, and the gentleman in the yellow jacket as well. Are they brothers? Okay. Yeah, we are brothers. So, I guess just the, I feel there's this sort of elephant in the room that nobody has talked about already yet, which is to quote George Monbiot exponential growth on a finite planet just doesn't work, right? So this late stage neoliberalist model that we have at the moment, or unregulated capitalism, isn't working. But that's not the bit we're talking about. Um, and actually, I'm not sure if many people know in this room, but I read that the carbon footprint was actually invented by fossil fuel industries to put the onus back on individuals rather than the systems of others. So I guess what I wanted to say was, would you all be in agreement that we need institutional and systemic changes in our decision-making processes? And if so, is that not where our focus should lay in fighting for diversifying our decision-making processes, such as fighting for citizens' assemblies? And you councillors particularly could be with, that, with us on the streets fighting to get citizens' assemblies and anybody else who wants to. Thank you.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that, you know, from what we've heard, just listening to what's happening with councillors, is that not, you know, we are so hamstrung by the system that things just aren't, aren't happening. Um, and they have to happen because, you know, the, the system is broken. You know, it, it can't cope. As I said earlier, if they're still teaching economics the same as they were 30, 40 years ago, it didn't work then, it's not working now, and absolutely it has to change. And, the, and just, I think one of the frustrating things for me is that so many things that are happening locally are governed by um, the, the, the parties that we're in, and that, you, that some people feel they have to vote with the party line, and they don't vote with common sense, they don't vote looking after people that they're supposed to represent. Um, and that's really distressing because actually it should be about the people and the environment and communities that we live in and not about what party line says. So yeah, it's got to be a system that changes. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. Systemic change, I think we've seen the impact of Brexit, we're already seeing it. So I like working a lot with the agricultural organisations in North Sussex. Their turnover is about a billion pounds. I've talked to farmers this year whose seeds did not get into the country in time because our import side is not going to heat up to get seeds in, which means they miss planting and they miss harvest. 50% of the food that we eat in the UK comes from abroad. We're, we're going to have to change things, but actually our democratic system does not represent the people who do. It doesn't, it's a fact. Um, there's only a small percentage vote when I had this conversation earlier, it was the vote, 22% of people voted. Was it half of those were close to one? Yeah. So actually, the, the one thing that I see, I mean, the, I suppose the light at the end of the tunnel for me um, is, is the work that I am very fortunate to be able to do with young people. And I see a zero tolerance from them to the system that they're growing up in. Because the seeds are beautiful, and they just want them to have um, I think everyone just summed it up perfectly, really. Um, as young people, please just let us have an opportunity to actually take some leadership and some ownership of this because it is our future. We are the people that are going to outlive all of you, and that's kind of just a fact. That's how life works. So. <laughs> Is broken and it's incredibly difficult. And you know, even in the role that I'm in, I, I have a lot of conversations with people. Um, I'm choosing my words quite carefully, but it's like talking to a brick wall. And I think beneath everything, regardless of what your position is politically, you actually do know why what you're doing isn't beneficial to the planet. You know the answers. You know why you what you're doing is wrong and the impact that it's going to have. And if you don't know, there's probably some processes outside your window that are telling you those answers. And um, yeah, I think, you know, just please just listen to us because we, we have a voice and, and we're trying to fight, but there's always, there's almost like a roof that we keep hitting. And unless that roof gets opened and you actually allow us to be equal and stand with you and take ownership, um, we're not going to get anywhere. I'll just say, I'll, I'll collaborate. Let's think about the brutal maths of exponential growth. Just the maths. That figure I gave you for carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide since 1992 than in the entire history of the human race before 1992. If we carry on with economic growth at 3%, the same will happen again in 25 years. That's the doubling time. So the impact of our economic growth in the next 25 years will be the same as in the entire history of the human race before today. That's the brutal mass of exponential growth. We can't avoid it. So it's something based on exponential growth is designed to collapse. That's the situation we're in. It's not going to happen again. No, we've got a few years now to sort this out. It has to be front loaded. So, so that's that's the starting point. So I completely agree. And a lot of people have seen this, except the people who seem to be making the decisions. You're quite right. <laughs> so there are a lot of economists who are actually coming up with different ways of looking at the economy to actually make you know, allow for the fact that actually the economy is part of the environment. It's not the environment it's part of the economy. This is actually fundamental to a lot of economic thinking now, including Kate Rowell and her donut economics. Read that. But also, Professor Das Gupta, who wrote a report on the biodiversity of, uh, of the economics of biodiversity this year. Many people probably haven't heard of it. 
But the difference there was he was an economics professor contracted by the treasury. And he came up with everything that ecologists have been saying for the last 30 years, that the economy is part of the environment, not the other way around. So he's coming up with the recommendations for moving away from gross domestic product growth and thinking about what he calls improved growth. I'm not sure whether that's going to work, but it shows other people. <laughs> I was told that we have an hour and a half. We started at seven and it's exactly eight thirty. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm going to thank the panelists. I think, I think you've been brilliant. I have to say that. Really good. Uh, I'm going to. I thought the two of you, I thought you merged in one question. Oh, Go on then. Are we, all, are we all happy? I'm not going to be organised. Are you happy about that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just in terms of us being thrown out of the room or anything. No, go on, young man. Yeah. Go on. Thank you. Because firstly, obviously, we want a variety of people with different opinions from different ages. So I appreciate actually being able to say something this evening. Um, I think there's two things I wanted to say. We talk about things like the housing crisis. Now, I study architecture, or I deferred my second year, but I study architecture at Falmouth University. And through my own research, I've actually found out we've got 60, just over 67 million people, million people who live in the UK alone, okay? And we've got 20, uh, we've got 25 million houses. The average person per house is 2.5. We don't need more houses. The issue is we've got too many people owning too many houses. So that's good. Yeah. So we don't need to be challenging those things. Quite simple, Ginny and Keegan, many houses. Okay, so quite simple, we don't need to be talking about those things. And then furthering that, we go, oh, okay, so what can we do about this? And everyone goes, well, I'm not sure, we could change our own little bits in our life. You know, we could not drive, we could cycle a little bit more, walk, buy locally, go plastic free. But these things are all great, but we, have, we need systemic action, and that goes from the ground roots to start with. Two things that I think we're avoiding in this room a little bit, adding to citizens' assemblies, I think that's straight away intersectional issues. But secondly, we don't have many people in Chichester that actually want to go out and protest, work as a community, go out. We have about 30 people. We're like, 40 people were turned up in Chichester today to protest. I don't want to. And I think if we work together as a community rather than divisive, understanding that it's intersectional. We don't need to work with people just the same as us. We need to be working with an intersectional group. We need to have an eclectic society that comes together to say, look, we're different, but we're all fighting for the same thing. It's the planet, really. And I think simply we should all, would you agree that we need more people together out there, like every Thursday we'll be going most weeks, to talk about citizens' assemblies, to come out there and join us. Would you agree? Um, I'm sorry, sir. I have to stop you now. Um, I've got to stop there, but you asked a very pointed question. I, yeah, you're right. Yeah. No, well done, you. Well done, you. And on the you've got the question, panel. So, are you protesting? And be, 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 before Yvonne says it, of course, there are very many ways of protest. There isn't just on the streets, there are lots of other ways of protesting as well. And I guess you do quite a bit of that. I think, I mean, there's a lot of um, protests and campaign, you know, and I'm not just talking about CND and the pop tags because I'm in Glasgow, so we were massively on the streets for that because that was just so inevitable. Um, but one of the points that you raised that's a long to be is the housing crisis because actually the big problem I have, and the colleagues here who were socialist council know me well, the government doesn't build socially rented houses anymore. They build affordable rent, which is 80 percent market rent, which is not affordable. So it's completely inequitable, which is why I don't build houses anymore for a job. Um, but one of the things that I would say is it's about how you get out and how you engage with people and get them to join your message. And I think that's the big difficulty because what we find is we get isolated pockets of people that are really passionate.
mention it, but how do they get that message out there? I mean, I've got to say, the Black Lives Matter um, march in Chichester that happened in the summer, yeah, I was there with my kids, um, and I've got to say, for the first time in a long time, I was so proud to be in Chichester, because I thought, do you know, this is what it's all about. Do you know, this is what it's all about. So I think, yes, if you want to campaign, get out there and campaign, but get more people to join you, and it's how you get that message out there. And it is quite difficult to just I know that. I mean, I've worked in Dublin as well. I mean, and actually, we tend to find communities are much more insular in big cities, but the message gets out quicker, if that makes sense. And it's like it's not. But I would say, yes, and have to be really far. Yeah, I think, as you were saying earlier, it's a, yeah, not everybody will feel comfortable, but I think the people who would like to be get behind yeah, ex art citizens, assemblies, whatever it might be, is for other people to find the ways that work for them. And so, for people who don't feel comfortable being on the street, is to not say, well, then you're a bad person. Um, yeah, there are other ways that people can get involved, and it's about encouraging people to get involved in the way that they feel that they can make a difference. Yeah, so this is something that um, I'll be honest, I do struggle with quite a lot in my role and also leading the environmental society and I think probably Mark Free as well. Um, we have never uh, said that we are a protesting society, that's never what we've been about, but something I do want to really encourage is activism and ways that we can do that on an individual level in the way that we feel comfortable and I think at the moment this the media probably plays a very big part in this, it feels like unless we're shouting in the street with pickets, you're not actually uh, you're not actually an activist and you're not actually protesting. So I'm trying to um, share with the society at the moment and with young people in the street body in general is that you are just as much of an activist if you're sharing things online, if you're sharing information with people, if you're boycotting certain products, if you're purchasing certain products because of um, the ethics and the sustainability behind them and the businesses. There are lots of different ways that you can protest and be an activist. On a personal level, I absolutely believe that the way that we are going to make these changes is through extreme things like being outside shouting at people. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's about um, allowing people to actually recognise that there are lots of different ways to be an activist and there are lots of different ways to process. And I don't think that that information is quite out there yet. Just to leave this up, I, mean, I think it has to work at every level. Our campaigns at every level, from national down to county, down to district, to local, to parish, and community. So that's really important. You have to campaign at every level. And actually, being, you know, being a grey head, I'll get from the Wildlife Trust, I can actually get away with more extreme things in some of these meetings than if I was a class as a protester. I've, I've been able to question the whole concept of economic growth in front of people that wouldn't have dreamed of if I'd been doing that. Um, do I protest? I'm not a protester, it's not my comfort zone, but I have protested. You know, sometimes you feel you actually have to be there. But uh, I, I would say it has to be at every level. And I think, actually, that's one of the advantages of groups like this, it, it is at every level. But I think you're right, I think we do need more people at the cold base, because if I'm behind closed doors trying to quietly make an argument, it means nothing. Okay, so I am going to close now, um, but I'm delighted that we kept coming. No, thank you. And uh, what I was going to do, besides um, thanking the panel, is to thank you, the audience, for being here. It's been great. And there's some very good questions. I want to thank the organisers.